Welcome everyone to our webcast for this week. As governments argue back and forth on the pros and cons of quarantine, there is a sad but fascinating aspect of the Ebola epidemic that this procedure of quarantine actually has an ancient biblical source, albeit for a decidedly different purpose. Let me explain. In order to protect the population, the Ebola epidemic is forcing concerned countries to quarantine suspected carriers of this fatal disease. To the question of whether the government can confine people to what is basically house arrest without due process, the law agrees that both states and the federal government have the legal authority to isolate people in their homes or at other locations if they pose a substantial danger to public health. Historians tell us that this practice of quarantine, as we know it, began during the 14th century in an effort to protect European coastal cities from plague epidemics. In fact, ships arriving in Venice from infected ports were required to sit at an anchor for 40 days before landing. This procedure, called quarantine, was actually derived from the Italian words quaranta giorni, which means 40 days. I'm here to tell you, dear friends, the source, this source, the quarantine, is much older than the 14th century. In fact, it goes back to the book of Leviticus. Long before the world knew anything of the germs nor understood the concept of sickness being transmitted from person to person, the Torah established rules for the separation of the healthy from the infected. Those afflicted with what the biblical text calls metzora, tzaras, leprosy, were to be sent outside of the camp, isolated from human contact, until diagnosed well enough to return. Of course, the quarantine of the Metzora had nothing to do with the preventing of the spread of physical contamination. Because all Jewish commentators agree that the word Metzora, almost always incorrectly translated as leprosy, was used to designate an entirely different disease. Not a physical failing, but actually it was an ethical corrosion. A disease not of the body, but one of the spirit. A Mitzora was literally a motzi ra, someone who put forth evil, a slanderer, a gossiper, a spread of malicious rumors and accusations. Therefore his sin was social. That is why his punishment was to be removed from society. His speech caused harm to innocence. That is why he needed to be isolated. His words caused lasting wounds. That is why the Kohen, the priest, in his role as a spiritual doctor, removed him from the opportunity to cause further harm to others by sending him outside of the camp and separating him from all those he could ethically contaminate. It was an amazing concept that took the idea of, of infection far beyond the province of modern science and modern medicine. In the very first instance of the Torah of giving warning of a disease transmission, what does it choose to stress? It stresses the pollution of the soul above the plagues of the body. Yet in spite of its different focus, it opened up the gate to what we now have the consideration of isolation as a means of protecting the pure from the impure, the healthy from the ailing, and the potential victims from the carriers of the tainted. In fact, some academics have even suggested that the reason for the choice of 40 days for quarantine was actually adopted to reflect the duration of the major biblical events, such as the Great Flood that lasts for 40 days, as well as Moses' stay on Mount Sinai was for 40 days. By acknowledging the biblical source of quarantine in its original context, 
we can perhaps draw an important lesson from our present fixation with the threat of Ebola. Ebola is indeed deadly. It requires the utmost effort on our behalf to eliminate it. It justifies quarantine and isolation to prevent its source and its spread. Yet, long before the Torah dealt with the fears for our physical health, it demanded that we be concerned with isolating and quarantining the deadly contagiousness caused by the cruelty of words coming from our mouths and evil talk given voice by our lips. Indeed, how much more relevant has this become in our day, the day that we live in today with the internet, the tweet and the Twitter, the Facebook and the smartphones really have turned gossip and slander into, into a most concerning, you know, terrible text of our time when used improperly. For our age, there's no greater wisdom than the Talmudical teaching that slander, lush and horror, slays three people. Slander slays the speaker, the spoken to, and the one spoken of. Lush and horror, you know, evil talk. It may sound blatantly obvious that a community will function better without gossip, without slander and telling tales. And yet the Torah goes out of its way to tell us of its dangers. Yet like so many other things, if we take an honest look around us, we do need to be reminded about these values. I was once at a synagogue where the rabbi got up and said that his dream was to create a community where nobody spoke slander or gossip. Nobody spoke badly of anyone else. At the time, it sounded rather simplistic and naive. But on reflection, it really is a profound notion. So many other problems which stem, so many of our problems actually come from malicious gossip, from rumors, slander, that can be avoided by cutting out the slander and the gossip. We must realize the power of speech that we all have. A person may possess a negative characteristic, but the natural good in him will strive to suppress this aspect and redirect it for good purposes. When this negative trait of slander is, is spoken of, it is made much more real when we speak about it. If you say something bad about a person, you actually reveal that. By defining it, you're actually harming that person. You're giving it a sense of substance and validity. That's the power of slander. In effect, you bring it out in a far greater measure. That's why slander kills the person who slanders, the ones listening, and even the person who's not even there that we're talking about. Conversely, speaking favorably about someone else, accentuating his or her positive side, helps that person to realize the positive qualities that you are tri attributing to them. And they will grow accordingly. We all know how we feel when someone gives us a compliment. When we're thankful for what we do, it brings us, it strengthens us. It gives us the power, the ability to move forward and to accomplish so much. So, dear friends, let us use our power of speech and our ability to influence in a very positive way. This is Rabbi Pearl. Thank you so much for joining us.